Welcome to Her Story on a Plate, a place for real talk about real bodies. Let's dish about our complex relationships to food and bodies. We are two experts in the field coming at this from an anti-diet, your body holds wisdom approach. This podcast is all about changing the conversation we have in our heads and culture so that we can embrace ourselves fully. Hi, everyone. So today's episode actually gives you an insight about how I met Nina. Nina is a phenomenal clinician. She's a phenomenal chef. She does so many things. And I saw her on Facebook, and she was cooking up a storm. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, there are people that know how to do that. I I am not a cook. I, I find it close to torture. It doesn't mean I don't like to eat. It doesn't mean I don't know good food, but boy, oh boy, put me in a kitchen. And I'm the kind of person that if you give me a recipe, you can't say things like cook until done. I don't know what that means. You have to tell me I need 17 and a half minutes at 424 degrees. That's it. So today's episode really, I think, highlights our relationship to food, but also to cooking and how it can be some level of self-care. And even if it's not your thing, like it is not mine, you can still be extremely self-caring and very careful about your relationship to food. So Nina, take us into yes. your world about, I feel like I'm interviewing you. <laughs> take us into your world. Can you start us off with really how you developed such a knack for creating and and cooking and and all of the that you do with food. Absolutely. So first I want to say there was something you said in there, Jenny, that I was like, wait a second. Because you said, I think this is what you said. You said to have a careful relationship with food. I'm not so into having a careful Caring. What did you say? More, more like caring. Caring. Right. Sorry. Caring. Right, yeah, caring. No, no. I'm good. Caring relationship with food. Yes, absolutely. Caring relationship with food. And what I want it to be is fun. Mm. What I want it to be is pleasurable. What I want it to be is creative. And literally, Jenny, I didn't know how to cook. I didn't grow up cooking. Mm. I had no clue I was privileged enough to grow up in a house where food just showed up on my plate. And then I moved to New York where I lived on falafel for 10 years and raised pizza. I never had to cook. And then I went and lived at Kripalu, you know, an ashram for five years. I didn't have to cook then. And suddenly there I was married and getting a house. And I was like, oh, wow, we can't afford to eat out. So my husband and I looked at each other and I said, why don't you be the cook? Because he actually knew how to cook. And he's like, no, I don't really like cooking. He's like, you, you be the cook. And I was like, well, I could try. So for two years, I kid you not, anything I made, he said, this is the best thing ever. I can guarantee you it absolutely was not the best thing ever. They talk about positive reinforcement. I think they call that love. (laughs) They do. They call it love and self-interest. Because eventually I got in there and made enough messes and did it wrong enough that I started to get clear on what I liked and what was enjoyable for me and what was fun and what were my go-tos. And I feel like that's so important because what it speaks to is our expectation of what food is supposed to be on our in our life, how it's supposed to look. And many of us grew up on Julia Child and cooking shows where it Mm. needed to look plated and it needed to look this way. And the expectation, just like we have the expectation about what our body should look like, and that expectation is ridiculous and idealistic and an absolute fantasy, so did our relationship with food and cooking become that. Mm. It's funny you mentioned Julia Child. I have such fond memories of her. But I also remember, remember Graham Care? 
No, oh say God. more. Oh God, what was the name of his show? Um, he was a very good chef, but he also didn't take himself seriously. And it was meant to be very, you know, sort of fun. And he was very funny. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I, I'm sure someone will think of it while we're, while they're listening to us, but it was a interesting, interesting show. So, you know, I'm thinking about this idea that you didn't cook for so long and then you did. Mm -hmm. It sort of crashes down my theory because my theory was that if you've been mm -hmm. exposed to cooking, because I know so many people who cook really well and enjoy it and love it, and that's how they grew up. They grew up watching yeah. either a parent or a grandparent bake, cook, and do it with such finesse and with love. And it was just sort of in their environment. And so mm -hmm. they brought it up. Nothing against my mother of blessed memory, but cooking was not her thing either. And so yeah. she had like a basic six things she could make so that we could get through the week and have one night of, you know, ordering in. It's kind of what I have. I think there is something to be said about what we're exposed to, but then our natural talents and our natural proclivities come through also. Well, and also the willingness to let it be not perfect, hmm. right? For a long time, I would make these things that I, I would make stir fries because I was like, well, this is easy. But I was like, it never tasted the way that I wanted it to taste. So then I started looking like, how do you make a stir fry? Well, it turns out you need a sweet and a salty, a sweet and a sour to give it that yummy, tangy flavor that I always loved at Chinese restaurants. Mm. Okay. So now I've got one and literally, where did I learn that? Like on the back of the tofu package. <laughs> that was some of my earliest cooking techniques. Like, okay, it says do this and this. I'll do this because they're literally marketing this product with that recipe. This better turn out. So my invitation is really when there's a desire to have a little more ease in the kitchen is choose one thing. One thing that you like, that was my thing for a long time. I'm going to make stir fries and I'm going to make it until I like it. Mm -hmm. And I think about this also with my son when he was starting to cook. What did he start cooking? Eggs. Make yourself eggs for breakfast. In the beginning, they were a disaster. He's the best egg maker, right? Mm. Then he was like, he can't eat gluten. So we would go to these places and they would have crepes. And he was like, I really want crepes. And I was like, well, I bet we could make gluten-free crepes. And then I made them. And then he was like, well, I want some. And I was like, well, here's the recipe. You do it. Now he makes them better than I do because mm. he's done it over and over. Those are his house specialties. Do you think there's such thing as cooking trauma? I once yes. Made, okay, so I <laughs> I once made breakfast in bed for my parents' anniversary. Now I couldn't have been more than nine, maybe, mm -hmm. and I decided that I was going to make them scrambled eggs. But no one told me that you had to scramble them, so it was sort of like one big sort mm -hmm. of egg pancake. And mm -hmm. it was sort of like asking them to eat like a rubber chicken. It was just horrible and <laughs> awful. And I remember distinctly the look on their faces when they took a bite because, you know, they were loving and they wanted to thank me for mm -hmm. this wonderful effort. But it seared in my brain because I could see that it was just like, oh, boy, that's not how you do it. Now, you know, I, just, I didn't know. I was nine. But totally. The first time, right, I'm an adult. I'm with a house. I invited my sister over for dinner. It took me three hours to make dinner. This was not a complex multi-course dinner. Three hours. And I, she finally, like, we're finally eating. And I was like, I'm never doing this again. Not ever. Right. But I got better. Mm. Again, it speaks to the expectation. Right. Where are we setting the bar in terms of how we feed ourselves? Are we expecting ourselves to do this multi-course meal? Are we expecting ourselves when people say, well, I just, I'm too tired of cooking. I'm like, it's not just cooking. Mm -hmm. You have to think about it. You have to plan. Then you have to make a list. Then you have to go to the store or order online. Then it has to show up. Then you have to bring it into the house. Then you have to put it in the fridge. Then you have to take it out of the fridge. Then you have to wash it. Then you have to chop it. Then you have to cook it. 
then you put it on the table, then you eat it, then you got to wash up and put it all away. You lost me at you have to. See, right after right, right after that, as you started this list, you lost me. Right. Right. It's hard. For- but that's the yeah. issue is it can't. It's too much of an expectation, yeah. right? Most of us are busy and we're taking care of other humans in our life in some capacity. And life is stressful and full. So how do you take a nine-step process and make it much shorter? And I'll just tell you honestly the way I do it. Food shows up without me going online. I get a box of produce delivered. I don't think about it. I set it and I forget it. And there it is on Fridays. I have fish delivered, Mm -hmm. right? And then I will get my dried goods delivered. Like once a month, I'll go online and do it. So I open the fridge And basically step one through five is already done. Mm -hmm. And then I am not trying to go super gourmet every night. I'm doing some basics, things I know that I love. Lunches, I'll often do a quesadilla. I love these siete food tortillas. They're out of almond flour and I'll put in avocado Mm -hmm. and some smoked salmon or hot smoked salmon or tuna, a little, I can't do cow cheese, so I'll do a little vegan cheese, some tomatoes, stick it on the grill, five minutes, and I have a delicious lunch. You're actually bringing up something important. So you're able to do that perhaps on a day that you're working from your home where you have access to your kitchen, right? Okay. So for many folks, right, they're in an office or they're doing something Mm -hmm. offsite. And It's all they can do, first of all, to remember to eat. And then when they actually remember to eat, it's what can I grab quickly? There are a certain percentage of people who sort of spend Sunday cooking for the week and they have things Mm -hmm. they can pull from and take with them. But I I think that's become more of a rarity. For those who have young children, it's all Mm -hmm. they can do to get them out of the house with their lunches. Sometimes, you know, lunch is available at school, but often they have to make lunch. So a lot of it is also being practical and kind to yourself about what your logistics are and what your situation is, right? Right. What is possible for you? One of the things that we do at dinner when we're tidying up dinner is put in a container lunch for my husband. Mm -hmm. So Kyle takes it with him the next day, Mm -hmm. right? If I know I'm heading out onto something not working from home, then I'm packing it up the night before. But to expect ourselves in the morning to get breakfast, to get lunch, to get snacks, to get out of the house, it's just, again, unrealistic expectations. I think another thing that enters into the discussion is fear of food. Forget cooking Mm -hmm. for a moment, but fear of food, right? There are folks that either avoid cooking altogether or they cook in a very, what I'm going to call, restrictive way Mm -hmm. because they're afraid to make something that's, quote, fattening or they're Mm -hmm. afraid to make something that's greasy or whatever their concept of it is, right? Imagine having a freedom to say, you know what? What's going to be first here is, what do I love? Yes. And can I create what I love? Can I reproduce what I love? Mm-hmm. Am I capable, funny coming from me, about just looking at a recipe and being able to reproduce that? And can I see creating food, creating a meal, baking, whatever it may be, as an act of love not mm-hmm. only for myself, but for the others for whom I might be making it. Yeah. I think it's a different frame. It's a very different frame, right? Mm-hmm. Coming to food from a place of drawing close instead of pulling away, right? Pulling mm-hmm. away is, uh-oh, the fear. Drawing close is, oh, this is something delicious, sensual, nourishing for myself and for my family. And Jenny, you brought up something a couple of times that I think is really important, which is how we cook and what our style is, right? So I'm somebody who's going to open a fridge and just pull stuff out and create it. You're somebody who's going to look at the recipe and Mm -hmm. follow it accurately. So I have two very dear friends that we do Girlfriends Weekend, 
and we all cook very differently. And it's really interesting to watch. So one friend is a cook like you. She looks at the recipe and this is what's going to happen. Then there's me who's like, so what do we got this weekend? We all brought some groceries. Let's do this and this. And then there's this other friend who has like a research brain. She's like, okay, well, if we're going to do Thai food, this is the flavor profile. If we're going to do Japanese food, this is the flavor profile, right? Super analytical sort of categorizing brain. All of those kinds of brains are welcome in a kitchen. And you you all get along in the kitchen? We do because we kind of know when to let the other person step out and which recipe who gets, right? Right. Who gets what recipe? You're going to make this, I'm going to make this, and you make that. And sometimes we're going to place, I'm like, oh, this is too fussy for me. Mm. I'm like, Paula, you take over. Because it's all like the quarter of this and a half of this and a this of that. I'm like, I am not, I'm just going to wing it and it's not going to end up being that recipe. She's like, no, 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 I really want to try this recipe. I'm like, how about it? Mm. But that's not me. Right. It's It's letting ourselves be ourselves. You said something before too, which I think is worth repeating that nothing has to be perfect. (sighs) This is not a performance. It's a creation. It's Mm -hmm. like when you think of it like art, right? When one is creating art, I mean, I imagine in the artistic process, part of it is just about Mm self-expression and better artist you are, there's a lot of thought that goes into what materials and the statement you want to make, and you still don't know how it's going to come out. And if you want art to be perfect, you can't, you won't be able to create it. You have to have an openness to just put onto the canvas what appears and then work with what's there. To me, cooking can be like a canvas. It's funny that you mentioned your friends, right? I'm reminded of, um, I have a group of friends who, if they're listening, they'll know who they are. There's about six or seven of us, and we've known each other for more years than I'd like to admit. They're all really, really good at cooking and creating, and we all got together at someone's home in Arizona. And I sat at the counter and watched this process. I was really Mm -hmm. learning. And we all do what we do best. I had KP duty. I set the table. Mm -hmm. I sort of made it pretty. I was Mm -hmm. just sort of facilitating. I was kind of cleaning as they went so that they wouldn't be left with a big mess. And watching what they were doing, we all enjoyed. Everybody knew what they had to do. And it just had such a natural rhythm to it. Mm. It it can be fun. It can really be fun. That's it, right? It can be fun. And Mm. I want to go back also to that analogy of being an artist, Mm. right? When we start learning to draw or playing with paints, they don't put the Crayola 52 set in front of us. They put the Crayola 6 set. Here are the six colors. Mm. Start there. Let's play. So when I was in graduate school and we got the house when I was in graduate school, and I said to some girlfriends, I was like, I don't cook. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Mm. And they gave me a recipe book, 10 dishes five ingredients or less. And I was like, I, no, I, honestly, I can't cook. They were like, you can read like giant textbooks for graduate school. I can imagine you can read this book with five ingredients and figure this out. And I was like, ah, uh, okay. And it took me a while, but honestly, for the longest time, the way I would find recipes was how many ingredients does this have? Because Mm. if I have to chop 10 things and then make this other little dressing and then this other little coulis, I'm out. I don't have the time. I don't have the detail brain for that. But you give me those five ingredients, put it up in a pot and mix it around and ta-da, you have a quiche. I'm like, excellent. I'm good to go. Mm. So it's really, again, I know I keep saying it, but What's possible without the expectation of grandiosity in this? There's another element to this too, which is culture. I think Mm. that it's an opportunity not only to create, not only for it to be art, not only for it to not be perfect, not only for it to be fun, but to also have it be an expression of however you identify 
culturally. Mm. We all have some exposure, some memory of things that have been made, let's say at specific holidays mm-hmm. or at specific occasions, things that naturally resonate as an expression of your culture. And if that's something that sort of drives you more, it makes it just a little easier, I think, to prepare. And it speaks to literally our podcast, Her Story on a Plate. What Mm. is your story? What is your food story? What Mm. is your food history? Her story, right? What was the thing that was served to you that you loved as a kid? You know, I'm thinking about any number of clients that I've worked with who, unfortunately, you know, no blame here, they grew up in households where food was a very restrictive thing. Mm -hmm. Weaponized. People in the house were on diets all the time. And Mm -hmm. so those who were dieting didn't trust having in the house things that would, quote, tempt Mm -hmm. them. And so things were really, really restrictive. There are also, you know, family situations where the old expression, latchkey kids, right? Where families are working and they don't perhaps have Mm -hmm. the ability to pay for, you know, some nanny. And so there's a lot of self prep. There's a lot of just trying to make sure that you feed your kids. It may not be exactly what you wanted it to be. So again, it's giving yourself grace. I I say this to myself as I'm saying it to all of you, right? It's about giving yourself grace and not being afraid to fail. That's really, I think, the bigger point. What is the worst thing that can happen? It'll taste terrible. Okay. Yes, I realize there's a little bit of waste there. I get it. If you don't eat it and you throw it out, I understand. We want to save the planet. But I'm also saying that I think the more you experiment, the more that you just try to create... I think you do get more comfortable. I mean, I'm saying I don't cook. The truth is, I, I mean, I, I do get more comfortable with a number of things. Right. Right. But there's a piece that happens before that ability to either get creative or to prepare food, and that is having food in your house. Mm. And it's honestly something I end up talking to clients about a lot because sure. they're like, well, I just didn't eat. And then I was starving. I was like, well, what's in the fridge? Well, I haven't shopped. I'm like, okay, it's very hard to make choices that are nourishing when there is nothing to choose from. So how do you make sure that there is a fridge that you open that feels like there's choices for you? Because then you can be in the conversation with your body. What do I want to eat? What am I in the mood for? What would be fun to create if as long as there's a basic palate? For sure. And there are people who are afraid to have food in the house. Mm -hmm. Whether they live with other people or whether they live with themselves, they're literally afraid to have food in the house. Yeah. Because of whatever their relationship to food is. And in those cases, you know, I mean, I encourage them to either with a clinician or with a friend or with something, someone that you trust, take someone with you to go shopping. Mm-hmm. So that you have so an experience that isn't just running in and out of a store and grabbing the thing that's either the least calories or the least price or whatever it is, and just yeah. go with someone else's eyes because they can see things that you're not seeing on purpose. It's a very, very compassionate thing to do, and it can be fun yeah. also. Yeah. And you're Jenny, you're also speaking to one of the basic tenets of intuitive eating, right? Full permission to eat. So when we're busy trying to make sure there's no food so that we're not, I'm putting this in air quotes, tempted, right? Then we're in that restrictive mode. If Mm. we can experiment, even if it feels a little bit edgy for us, experiment with, can I give myself permission to eat? Mm. And letting ourselves walk into that, because the more permission we give ourselves, the more choice we're actually giving ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because it's no, 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 and you only get yes because it's a stick of celery or whatever else that ends up in that narrow column of 
acceptable food, Mm. then there's that natural tendency to swing to, wait a second, I feel restricted. I'm going to eat whatever the heck I want. And maybe even in secret. Let's talk for a minute. You just really got my thoughts brewing. Let's talk for a minute about cooking as it relates to disordered eating. So Mm -hmm. for instance, if you are someone who tends to emotionally eat, binge eat, compulsively Mm -hmm. overeat, and by the way, those three things are different and similar. One of the things we find is that if you allow yourself the experience of cooking, you're actually less likely to do so. Now, there are those mm-hmm. listening who would say, you don't know me. While I'm cooking, I'm eating while I'm, I'm what nibbling, I'm nibbling, yeah. Ingredients. Yeah, okay, who doesn't? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, I get mm-hmm. it. It's mm-hmm. nibbling, I, I understand, and it can get out of hand. There's something, though, about when you're creating something, and again, to your point, simple as can be, make it simple. But when you're preparing, you are less likely to shovel it in, eat it too quickly so that you don't even know what you had. It's very different than when you order something in or you buy some binge foods, but to take the time to actually give yourself Mm self-care, make that meal, does it guarantee that you won't? No. But I think it's an interesting practice to take on. There are people who binge eat or emotionally, let's say, throughout the day. By the time dinner time comes around and they have to prepare for other people, Mm -hmm. they will do it, but they wind up not eating what they made because they think, oh my God, I ate too much. They feel like I already ate too much. Yep. That's right. And and what that Mm -hmm. does, it creates a disconnect between you and the people that you could have sat down and eaten with. So it's just an ability to just say, okay, you know what? At this particular time, if my schedule allows I'm going to make something for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I sometimes do when I notice myself doing like girl dinner or girl lunch, if you haven't heard it, it's like a phenomenon on social media is like women who go and like, okay, I'll have a stick of cheese and then let's see that leftover brownie looks good and I'll do carrot that's been sitting there. It's sort of an assemblage of whatever is going, right? It's not an actual preparation. And when I see myself going to that, like, oh, let me just grab a little of this, a little of that. I sometimes think to myself, what would I make if someone was sitting with me? Mm. Because we are much more likely to activate our sense of giving when we think about someone else. And if we can activate that sense of being in service to with ourselves, around food, it feels so good. It may feel unfamiliar, but we can get better at it. The act of giving is an important thing to really reflect on here. I know you and I both lead, facilitate groups. And in those groups, one of the most powerful thing is this idea, if you could just talk to yourself the way you talk to them. (laughs) If you could just treat yourself the way you treat them with the same Mm -hmm. understanding, compassion, lack of judgment, and it's authentic. Imagine if you could just talk to yourself that way. This is sort of the same thing. Yeah, it is. And using that as a way to access the energy Mm -hmm. to actually make a nice plate of food that you're really going to sit down with versus grab and just eat while you're at your computer and trying to get the next thing done. Sure. So to round this out, I think it's worth saying that each of us on our websites have a lot of good resources for cooking and other such things. But is there any sort of favorite chef that you like? Is there is there someone that you follow that for whatever reason resonates, you know, that there's, I mean, I'll just say as a non-cook, mm-hmm. I love Ina Gardner because I think she just simplifies. Mm. Everything comes out beautifully and delicious. And I have to say, it's really not hard. She just sort of simplifies it. It doesn't make it, she's not dumbing it down. She's really yeah. saying, she says, I heard her in an interview recently. She said, I made it as simple as I could make it for me. And yes. I think it's been part of her success. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. My approach often is 
I'm in the mood for, or what came in my box of produce is, I don't know, celery yak or lots of zucchini. And I'm like, hmm. And I'll literally Google zucchini recipe, five Mm. ingredients. I still do the five ingredients thing. I have loads of recipe books, but often they're fussier than I'm willing to do. But I'll flip through and I'll go like, oh, that looks good. How do I simplify that? So you do Google cooking. I do Google cooking. I do Google cooking and I do what we talked about before is default cooking. Oh, I've made a stir fry a gazillion times. And this time we have some leftover fish. I'll put that in. And we have a lot of leeks that got delivered. Let's use that. I just want to know, is there a recipe online for Google pudding? No. (laughs) It feels like there should should be. (laughs) You know we're going to be searching for that after Google Google pudding. pudding. All right. That's good. Yeah. But I think the message that I want to impart is mm-hmm. to lower the expectation and increase your amount of giving to yourself mm-hmm. when it comes to your energy around food, that you deserve it. Because under all of this is that issue of, do we deserve our time and attention? And the answer, in case you were not clear, is absolutely yes. Yes. We all deserve that care and time and attention, and we all need to eat. That is a feature of being a human being. Mm. And when time is not available, there are ways to figure it out where you can do it much more quickly. I'm thinking about when I was young, crockpots were big. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they still are, but there's a different version of it that I see a lot of. Instant pot. Instant pot. Okay. Okay. Well, you can just instant pot air fryers. I have them all because they all toaster ovens, mm-hmm. all of them make it more convenient. And yeah. we want that. We want it to be easy. And I am a big proponent of set it and forget it cooking. I am not very good at like staying in front of the stove because I'm doing a lot of things at the same time. And those kind of things let you do that. For those who have concerns about money, these things don't have to be costly either. They really don't. You can keep it basic and tasty, time limited, financially limited. You really can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And keep it to five ingredients as you. It's important, right? It is. Yeah. So thanks for this discussion because, first of all, it gives me the opportunity to tell everybody how I met you, watching you cook Mm -hmm. on Facebook, right? I know. Also, it it continues to inspire me to really Mm -hmm. just, even at this stage of life, to just keep cooking and creating. Yeah. Let's do gentle cooking. That's what we need. Gentle cooking. I love that. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jenny. Sounds like the title of a podcast. I'm not sure. It does. (laughs) Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to Her Story on a Plate. Keep in touch with us at herstoryonaplate.com. We'd love to hear from you. See you next time.